My name is Karen Emmons. Um, I have the pleasure of being on a, a IPA at the National Cancer Institute in the Implementation Science Group, and uh, I'm uh, very delighted to uh, kick things off today and provide a welcome to you. Um, as I mentioned, this is the second in our series of uh, five-part series where we will be looking at different aspects of implementation science, bringing together um, researchers who are working in the space, funders, and policymakers. We have a fantastic panel uh, today, which is going to be moderated by Ross Brownson, the Stephen H. and Susan U. Lipstein Distinguished Professor at Washington University. Dr. Brownson is the perfect moderator for today. He came to academia with extensive experience in public health practice, and in my mind really epitomizes the concept of a bilingual scholar who's an outstanding researcher and also deeply experienced in practice and policy, as exemplified by the fact that he is past president of the American College of Epidemiology and past president of the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. He's been a leader in efforts to apply dissemination and implementation science to health policy. So we're delighted uh, to have him today as our moderator, and I'm gonna kick it over to Ross to lead us through today's session. Thanks, Karen. You're hearing me okay, right? Great, okay. Well, thank you. I'm really, really pleased to be with everyone today. Um, I think we have a really great turnout and we're gonna have a really excellent uh, panel discussion today. Um, just to sort of set the stage for today, um, I want to just mention three key points. One, policy has a profound effect on people's lives, on health and health equity. We all know that. It's also a very important topic for implementation science. And the third point, it's very often understudied in implementation science. And so there are a lot of opportunities to study this, but in a bigger sense, have an impact on on the health and well-being in people's lives and health equity overall. So today we have a, 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 a just a stellar lineup. They're all three people are super smart, they're super accomplished, and they have academic and practice practical experience. That is really the ideal blend for what you'd like to hear about today. Um, you have in your in your invitation their longer bios. So I'm just going to give brief highlights from each, and then we're going to go in the order that I'm mentioning. So first, um, coming to us from Rutgers, Rutgers School of Communication and Information, is it, Itzhak Yavaninsky. And Itzhak is an expert in behavior change communication, public policy making, translational research, and program evaluation. He has appointments that cover a, a vast range of responsibilities from global health, healthcare policy, aging research, and does a lot of teaching and mentoring. Itzhak's going to come to us and speak specifically about one tool in policy research, and that is knowledge brokering. Second in our lineup is Monica Valdez Lupi, who is uh, newly named as the managing director of the Presky Foundation Health Program. Monica is an attorney by training. She has extensive experience in the practice world um, with 20 years of experience in public health. Just a few highlights she's been a senior advisor to the CDC Foundation on the coronavirus. Uh, she was previously the director of the, executive, of the Boston Public Health Commission, that is the local health department for the city of Boston. And you'll hear a bit about her experience today. The theme for Monica's presentation will really be around this idea of community engagement and stakeholder engagement around policy change, um, engaging in a tobacco control example from her work. And then third, we'll have with us Karen Bogenschneider, who is the Rothermel Bascom Emeritus Professor of Human Ecology at Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has an extensive track record in policy research and policy change. She's the director of a really important entity called the Wisconsin Family Impact Seminars. Um, and she's got a lot of experience working with state policymakers. Um, just as a note, um, Karen Book, along with Tom Corbett, the second edition called Evidence-Based Policymaking is about to come out, and it's been a main book um, for our work and helping frame a lot of the work of my teams over the years. And Karen will talk to us third about her work with state legislators, bringing them into the policy process and some of the lessons that she's learned. So let's get it started. Um, we're going to begin with Itzhak and um, Vanessa, if you can hand off the slides to the right person, we can bring up it sucks slides. Great. 
Thank you, Ross, and I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody who can join us today. So I'm, I'm going to try to be brief and tell you about a knowledge brokering as a strategy for a connecting research with practice. Before I start, however, since I attended the previous, the first one uh, of these uh, series uh, of five seminars, uh, one of the questions that came up uh, in that discussion was, where can I find tools that help me to do a better job communicating as scientists? I'm hoping that uh, they can post some resources for you in the chat. One of the things uh, I'm involved in is the Standing Committee of the National Academies of Science Communication. And so one of the resources I'd like to share, bring to your attention is there's actually a whole a, a book, a monograph that talks about communicating science effectively. The National Academies produce a lot of great uh, ideas about how to connect with policymakers, but generally in the, with the public as well. Uh, AAAS has also a um, program to focus on communicating effectively with policymakers. And so I'm hoping that can share the link uh, with that. And there's another link that I want to bring to your attention. That's a Scholar Strategy Network. These are a wonderful group of people who can help you uh, put together an op-ad for uh, based on your research or get you connected with policymakers. So there's various resources out there that I want to point out. That takes me to my next slide and, um, and talk a little bit about uh, how I approach, how we see this issue of connecting with policymakers. And I want to contrast two type of uh, views on how we communicate. One is dissemination, which we all know a lot about, versus engagement. And I want to make that distinction. What I want to point out very quickly is when we think or approach the problem we try to solve, which is how we connect uh, policymakers with research as a dissemination problem, what we're really focusing on is the fact that we have research that we think is relevant and we want to bring it to the attention of policymakers. So it's really uh, the problem we're facing is one, how do we get that there? Now, what route are we taking and to introduce or making sure that policymakers do at least consider the evidence that we have. So it's a very much research focused strategy. And I want to contrast it with well, something I would argue work much better, which is an audience uh, oriented strategy. And that's really what engagement is all about. So engagement is recognizing that the problem is not that policymakers have some sort of a deficit, that they don't know which evidence to use, the evidence is too complex for them to understand, or they, they lack a potentially any any expertise to really analyze and understand that. So our job is to explain that better. That will be the kind of communication we typically think of when we think about how we improve our engagement with policymakers. But that perspective is focusing very much on us and what we try to accomplish as opposed to thinking about audiences and how we engage them. So an audience orientation here would focus on the metric of engagement just as we do with patients. And the idea is that we need to understand their perspective, their needs and their uh, interest and motivation to be able to be successful in connecting them with research. That takes me to the next slide, which I want to uh, uh, try and introduce you to um, uh, what I generally call the three hours of robust intervention. So, so as we think about uh, uh, how do we approach policy, because if we take the body of work that we have on, on policy, I don't know if we can move to the next slide. If we take that body of work, particularly uh, also the work that Karen has done, which was, has been pioneering uh, in that context, uh, we, we, if we take a step back and think about what do we see, what have we learned about uh, what are robust strategies for engaging policymakers with research, uh, I'm listing here that what, what I generally call the three R's. One of them is that it's important that whatever you do is going to be responsive to your audience. Again, it's audience orientation. So you want to make sure that the research you provide is, is a good match to what the needs are, the motivations, and also the circumstances that policymakers need. So it's not what I think is relevant, it's what policymakers think is relevant. They need to take into account and be responsive to that. That's the first R. The second R is about routinize. It's about the fact that we need to recognize that there are evidence used routines, just like we as scientists have evidence used routines, the way we use research, the way we communicate with research, so do policymakers. So if we understand their routine, and that's true for practice as well, if we understand their routine, we need to find a way to integrate our research or plant it in that routine that will increase the likelihood that we that will use research evidence. So if research evidence coming as a disruption to their routines, it's less likely to be used. If it's integrated with routine, it's more likely to be used. And the last one, of course, as, as we all know, is that What's unique about policy is that everything is involved or embedded in relationships. 
So relationships are very important because they need to be trusted in order to be able to uh, provide research. So research uh, policymakers have the people they trust and they turn to for advice. Sometimes these are scientists, other times these are not scientists. And we need to recognize that. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to move and talk a little bit about an, a knowledge brokering as a strategy. It's different kind of strategies. So it's only Karen and Monica are going to introduce a different kind of approaches. The one I'm focusing on is recognizing that when we talk about policy making, there's several things we need to take into account. The first thing we need to take into account is that policy making is inherently political. It's strategic, and uh, that's driven by what is possible in terms of what can be accepted, what will uh, be uh, uh, can potentially be implemented, as opposed to why, what is necessary and right, which is typically where we come from as scientists, is we know what's necessary, we know what's right, and we want to make sure that policymakers take this into account. However, they're considering it more kind of in terms of feasibility. Can I do this? Can Would it pass Congress? Would it pass Senate? And, and so forth. So sometimes we don't feel comfortable being political as scientists, but if you want to be involved in that game, you'll need to understand that the nature of decision making is, is political. The other thing we need to recognize is that uh, policy making is encompassing many, many different actors at different, act, uh, different levels who are connected in all kinds of ways. So we talk about research evidence being, uh, uh, being used, and that's actually Vivian Tseng, who had a chance to see last time. We talk about how the uh, uh, use of research evidence is unfolding within complex social ecology of relationship, uh, settings, and interests. And we need to understand that, that this chaos is there and, and that uh, uh, we need to embed our use of research evidence in that particular kind of context. Now, not surprisingly, I don't think you're gonna be surprised to know that research, if you look at the policy ecosystem as we depicted here, you can see that there's many uh, entities involved, anything from government and lobbyists and think tanks and policymakers and scientists and scientists often tend to be on the periphery of that network. Why? Because we don't engage as much as policymakers. We're coming from different, we have different sets of values, we have different sets of uh, uh, routines, and that can generate some sort of a, a challenge uh, when it comes to that. So we, what we're looking for with knowledge brokering, and that's really the idea, is that rather than me going and building relationships, which might be a little bit difficult to do and time consuming, we're not positioned to do this, who else already has relationship with policymakers that I potentially can leverage? And this can be both what we call internal brokers. People are already within government or within that policymaking process that uh, I may be able to engage with research, but there also can be people outside of that uh, policymaking process that could potentially, or well, better position in terms of the network position, in terms of the relationships they have, to introduce research to policymakers. And I'm referencing here at the bottom a piece, a, a piece that I published with Matt Weber that described the theory of knowledge broker. We talk about the, the functions that knowledge brokers perform in this ecology uh, in case uh, this is uh, relevant and interesting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things we realized, and that came from, from a project when we looked at uh, child obesity research uh, over a 14 year period in, in the US Congress, we wanted to see how research evidence is used in the context of a policy and this uh, make in the federal level around uh, uh, efforts to mitigate the child obesity. And one of the things, one of the striking things that we found when we did the analysis was that when we looked at the policy formulation stage, if you look at the, the bills that they introduced and, and where the research that is supporting that, these arguments about bills coming from, you know, it tends to come from the usual suspects, uh, you know, CDC, NIH, government research, and, and so research is there in a in very prominent way, and researchers are there in a very prominent way. Researchers are also there uh, in when solutions are being discussed. So uh, Ross, for example, had many times appeared before uh, Congress and gave testimonials about that, providing his expertise about what is the direction of solutions, what is, is uh, more effective, what is less effective. What we did, where we did not find researchers was in the implementation stage. When there was discussion about how we change nutritional guidelines in schools, the people who were there in the room to provide evidence were not scientists. These were the cafeteria managers or the farmers and others. So we realized that one of the things that's missing is information about implementation because policymakers have a tremendous amount of ambiguity around implementation. And then we ask ourselves the question, so who is positioned, who's already in this conversation, who's already positioned 
to represent this issue or remove ambiguity around implementation. And we decided based on what we saw that patient advocacy organizations such as NAMI, the American Cancer Society, American Diabetes Association and, and, and other organizations are actually well positioned within this ecology to broker research into policymakers. And the reason for that is because they already have the credibility, they have the reputation, they, they are trusted brands and policymakers often turn to them for, for advice and input. They already have established relationship with scientists and some of them actually, actually sponsoring research to some extent. So they already feel the boundary spanners in the sense that in between science and, and policy. And, and they also have the organizational capacity and that's really important. It's not an individual, it's organizational capacity. They're not going away anywhere soon. They have the capacity and resources, skilled personnel, and also the task and responsibilities like advocacy mission to be able to introduce research and, and make an impact on policy. They also have routines, again, going back to routines that, that are designed to influence policy, that interface regularly with policymakers and try to influence them. And also have the power to influence public discourse because they have a credibility and to that indirectly influence policymakers' priorities. So we, we, in our model, we decided POs are really great knowledge brokers. And all we need to do is really build the capacity of the new capacity around research, particularly research that's relevant to implementation. So if we can equip them with that research and equip, equip them, sorry, with, um, uh, with, with strategies they can use to promote this research, we build the capacity to do something they already do and do well, and we uh, therefore opening a path to uh, engaging policymakers. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna end up by telling you a little bit about a project Aspen. You can see the URL at the bottom, and you can find more details about that. But the basic idea here is that what we try to do with this project is to we focus in particularly on policies designed to increase access to screening for depression, particularly in schools for adolescents. We know that's a, that's a big priority, but schools, it's a great example of where the guidelines are clear about the fact that we should screen children, but there's a lot of concerns about implementation, both from the mental health professionals, but also from school personnel and others. And policymakers are willing to adopt the guidelines, but they're not sure about how to implement them. And that's what holding back legislation or evidence-based legislation. So we decided to go, uh, go ahead and collect information that we know policymakers might be interested in. They want to know how school professionals are going to respond to that mandate and how they're going to adapt uh, to it. They don't want to know about parents. Are they going to consent to the children being screened for depression if we make it universal and mandatory? And, and then there's the, the layer of the mental health professional, the mental health associations. Are there going to be links to services in the community? There's many, many questions policymakers have which we don't answer right now with research because we're focusing on the problem and the solution. And so we're collecting now this research, we're gonna make it available to a knowledge portal that will host, house this information and that will give access both to policymakers to this information, but also to the brokers who are active in that uh, work and they can now introduce that in. We're also gonna plan or we're planning to provide training on how to do, again, science communication more effectively and how to engage with policymakers and we're testing that in this project. So uh, we are in the second year now, we're hoping that we're gonna share findings uh, very, very quickly. So I wanna thank you all uh, for, for listening and I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. It's, uh, thank you, that was a great, a great start. Um, and we're gonna build on that with the theme you mentioned in, in your presentation on engagement. Before I hand it off to Monica, um, and you can go ahead and pull up Monica's slides if you would, Vanessa. Um, I want to just mention for the audience that please, as we go, if you have questions along the way, type them into the Q&A box and we'll be collecting those and having a, a significant time for Q&A at the end. All right. So Monica, why don't you come on, take the podium, the uh, virtual podium. Excellent. Great. And can you hear me okay, Ron? Yes, sounds great. Great. Great, thank you, Ross, and, and thank you, Itzhak, for uh, setting up, setting me up in terms of uh, sharing example of knowledge brokering in in action. And I'm going to follow Itzhak's lead, actually, in um, starting by sharing a tool uh, that I wasn't able to include in my slides, and that uh, is LawAtlas.org. 
and I can put that in the chat box later, but Law Atlas is a policy surveillance tool uh, that I know that we used when I was working with uh, ASCO and at the State Health uh, Department. And it's a tool that you can go to online to look at different maps, data tables, and uh, resources related to the state of different public health laws and how they've changed over time. So it is a, a type of legal epidemiology that I imagine can help uh, our researchers in terms of uh, looking at surveillance across different policy initiatives. So if you go uh, to the next slide, um, I wanted to say a little bit more about the, the Kresge Foundation. And so, as Ross mentioned, I'm the managing director there of the health program team. Uh, but just by way of introduction, uh, Kresge is based in Michigan. It's a national private foundation, and our overarching goal is to expand opportunities in American cities. Across these uh, programs and practice teams, uh, the foundation's investing more than $160 million annually uh, to support uh, communities on the ground and fostering economic and social change. I lead the health program team, but you see the other teams uh, that are there at Kresge, and we have two practices that focus their initiatives in Memphis, New Orleans, and Fresno, and we also have a social investment team uh, which supports community-based organizations in tapping into different uh, capital tools uh, to help them overcome financial barriers around community uh, development initiatives. Next slide, please. Uh, so on the health uh, program team, uh, our uh, activities and efforts are exclusively um, supporting investments in community-based organizations to build equity-focused systems of health that create opportunities for everyone uh, to achieve well-being. We're currently in the process of uh, evaluating and assessing our grant making and making sure that we're more intentional about applying a racial justice lens uh, to the grants that we're making across the country. Next slide, please. So I loved how Itzhak described um, uh, the work around uh, knowledge brokering because a lot of that happened in my previous role uh, before joining Kresge in leading the uh, Boston Public Health Commission, which is the local health department for the city of Boston. And I definitely think what he raised as uh, a factor in terms of uh, implementation uh, science and the convergence with a political context is something that uh, I wanted to underscore. Um, and how fortunate I was in terms of that political ecosystem in the city of Boston, not only uh, most recently when I served as the executive director, uh, but with the previous um, uh, mayor, Mayor Menino, that we had a lot of support from our elected officials and we had an, a progressive board of health and very innovative health department staff, which creates um, a really strong foundation and the ecosystem that we needed uh, in the city of Boston to develop regulations and policies that really impacted health for all of our uh, residents in the city. Uh, the example that I wanted to give was related to uh, the work that the health department's done around tobacco control uh, regulations. And uh, in this slide, we uh, see what I think is one of the biggest public health st success stories uh, of our time, which is this downward uh, trend in terms of youth smoking. Uh, just looking at what it was at 19 in 1976, at 29% of 12th graders reporting daily use of cigarettes uh, to uh, about 3.6%. This was in 2016. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we saw similar trends uh, in Massachusetts when we looked at uh, high school students. This is youth uh, risk behavioral survey uh, data and the, the slides I know and the data are a bit outdated, which is one of the challenges on the public health side are the data lags. Uh, but this is information and analysis that was done by our uh, Department of Public Health and their um, tobacco uh, control program. And, and what we see is what mirrored uh, the national trends in terms of a decrease in uh, tobacco use. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. Which really zeroes in on uh, Boston data. Uh, again, uh, using uh, our YRBS data. And uh, what I wanted to make a point is uh, in this particular slide is that um, policy takes a long time uh, to develop, and these relationships we developed 
with different stakeholder groups outside of the health department and our policymakers were critically important in uh, the successful uh, development and implementation of a series of tobacco control regulations that really did uh, make positive impacts across different um, health indicators. Uh, so that, that's one lesson that I wanted to share with you in terms of investing um, in those relationships with different stakeholders. And so, um, you know, the work that we did in Boston really started if we uh, go into the Wayback Machine, uh, and we were one of the first um, cities and one of the health de first health departments in the nation to pass very uh, robust uh, smoke-free workplace regulations uh, to uh, protect our workers from dangers of exposures to secondhand smoke. Uh, in 2008, uh, we took an opportunity to look at some loopholes in terms of continued exposures uh, for uh, workers uh, who are working in hotels and for wait staff who are working in restaurants with outdoor seating areas. And we were able to close this loophole uh, with their advocacy and, and support by expanding what how we defined uh, a workplace to include outdoor spaces. And at the same time, uh, our Board of Health also realized that there was a contradiction in um, the ability of um, pharmacies and local colleges and universities tobacco products. So in that same year, in that same series of regulation changes or amendments, uh, we actually banned and prohibited the sale of tobacco products in those settings. Uh, 2011, uh, we were seeing uh, e-cigarettes at that time uh, gaining popularity, uh, particularly among our young people. So the regulations were amended to treat e-cigarettes like traditional uh, cigarettes, and we restricted the sale of e-cigarettes to persons over the age of 18 and prohibited vaping in those places where smoking was not permitted. Uh, prior to my joining or rejoining the health department in 2015, we joined uh, a group of cities that were actually uh, leading the work to raise the tobacco uh, purchase age to 21. And at that time, we also um, uh, restricted the sale of flavored tobacco products um, uh, to adult only retail stores. Uh, so this uh, you know, slide really captures uh, the continuum of policy development that happened over time uh, with the support of many uh, different constituencies and stakeholder groups um, and, and partners. So next slide, please. Uh, we, what we were seeing, however, uh, despite these significant decreases in uh, cigarette and cigar smoking rates, was um, uh, beginning to see an increase in uh, the use of e-cigarettes. And 2015 was the first time uh, that we were able to, uh, that we started collecting data on e-cigarette use uh, with our uh, public school department. And, and so we were already beginning to see, and I think the rest is history, in terms of what we saw last year culminate with a lot of the uh, respiratory and, and lung uh, diseases that resulted from an exponential increase in youth use of e-cigarettes. Um, I think if you go to the next slide, uh, that is my last slide, and, and I want to talk a little bit more about what we did. And this is what I wanted to make sure that I, I uh, was able to conclude with was the power of community engagement. Um, last summer, so this was this uh, in July of uh, 2019, uh, was when uh, we partnered with um, our, our different uh, community and neighborhood groups in Codman Square, which is a neighborhood in Dorchester. And I was really impressed uh, because we needed their help uh, to really help us begin to work with our Board of Health and with the mayor's office in amending our regulations to close some loopholes from the um, 2015 uh, regulations. So menthol was a, a, one of the loopholes in that particular set of uh, amendments that we made. Um, we really relied on our community members to uh, bring uh, our partners together and um, for those of you who are not from Boston, to be able to bring together, uh, you know, I think we probably we packed the Great Hall. So we had easily over 100 young people and community partners with us really looking at um, what were disturbing uh, reports of increases 
uh, in vaping and also uh, the health disparities that were inherently um, that just part of the history of tobacco use with access and use of menthol tobacco products. And I can honestly say that if we did not have our partners uh, with us along the way uh, last summer, we would not have been able uh, to move our Board of Health and our uh, mayor forward in uh, what eventually was uh, a change in our regulations in uh, November of, of 2019 to close this loophole around uh, menthol tobacco products. Um, and so, um, you know, I think Itzhak alluded to it that the data and the research are critically important for informing program and policy design, uh, but clearly people and the communities that are impacted are equally important uh, to drive action. So knowing who those trusted partners are uh, for the research community and how you can work with them in terms of providing them with the tools that they need uh, to make the case uh, for advocacy and changes in policy are, are really important. Uh, and so, um, you know, if, if there's anything in terms of the takeaway uh, is the importance of uh, being able to uh, collaborate with your community partners and also if you're looking at policy uh, changes, working with your uh, local health department and your state health department. And, I, and so thank you very much for the opportunity to join the panel. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. And I think at this point, I turn it back to Ross to tee up Karen. Yes, thank you, Monica. Really great examples of both the power of engagement and then engagement on one of the most important public health issues of our time, tobacco control and the progress. It's really impressive. So thank you. Okay, let's try Karen and see how the voice is coming. We were having a little bit of audio difficulties earlier. Karen? Karen looks, moving. Yeah, Karen, it looks like you're muted still in the platform. They're with Vanessa, us. Karen, yep, we're Vanessa, still... I don't know if you're able to hit the mute icon next to Karen's name. Oh, there we go. Karen, are you able to, to chime in and make sure you're not muted on your cell phone as well? Okay, no, I'm not muted on my cell phone. Can you hear you're me? You're good. Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I have a voice. <laughs> Yay. Okay, well, let's bring up Karen's slides. Um, thank you, Vanessa. Excellent. Okay, should I start? Yes? Okay. Yes, go for it. Okay. I was afraid you lost my voice again. <laughs> Over the years, I've worked with dozens of researchers who are policy minded. I have worked with dozens of policymakers who are research minded. And I have witnessed the power of research when you bring researchers and policymakers together. You know, does research matter on every issue? Karen, it sounds like we, we, it, you're cutting in and out. Maybe if you want to take off uh, the microphone and just use it as kind of a regular speaker, that might help. Okay. Let's see, why don't I just try speaking into the phone? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I witnessed the power uh, in policymaking when researchers and policymakers come together. You know, does research matter on every issue? And does it matter to every policymaker? Of course not. So my comments are based on my studies, including recent interviews of 225 state policymakers with an unusually high response rate. And my studies will bring a voice, I think, to research that's often underrepresented, and that's the voice of policymakers themselves. Now, first, we heard that research is more important on some issues than it is on others. For example, we heard research is more important on new and emerging issues where policymakers have not yet taken a position, like opioid use and concussions and early brain science. We also heard that research is more important on technical issues like land annexation and rural internet availability. Here we have the words of a Republican in this next slide. 
Can you advance the slide for me? There we go. There is no, quote, Republican or Democratic theory about technical issues, and there's no big contributor to your campaign who cares about them. It's just like you're stripping it down to the essence of good government. Those are the kinds of issues where research could have a lot more impact. You got your big hot button issues that are highly politicized, which get all the attention in the newspaper, maybe 20% of the issues. But the other 80% are technical, yet very important to the government of the state. And I think you have a much more free reign to govern in an evidence-based manner. Now, we've also found that research is more important to some legislators than to others. In our studies, the use of research by policymakers really runs the gamut. So in one of our studies, we ran cluster analysis on how much um, legislators value, seek, and use research. And we found that some policymakers care a little about it. You know, in our sample, it was about 17%. They don't value it highly. They don't seek it out or use it very often. In contrast, about 25% of the sample valued it highly, frequently sought it out, and often used it in their decisions. And now there were two other clusters that kind of fell in the middle of these two extremes. And the key informants in our studies told us that the most influential legislators use research the most. So I think the questions we should be asking ourselves are how can we increase research use on timely topics where research is most apt to be used? And how can we increase its use among the policymakers who are most apt to take it into account in their decision making? Now, we started with theory to guide efforts on how to improve research use. And our community dissonance theory builds on Nathan Kaplan's two communities theory. And Nathan says that research is underutilized in policymaking, as you can see on the next slide. Can you advance? Thank you. Nathan said research is underutilized in policymaking because researchers and policymakers um, come from different communities and they live on different islands. They speak different languages. Uh, they have different information needs and they use different decision making processes. So the foundational premise of our theory is that if the research community had a better understanding of the policy community, you know, that's its culture, its institutions, um, its inhabitants. We could improve communication and trust across these two islands, and we could increase the use of research um, in policy making. Now, let's start with one element of our community distance theory, which is culture, which is in the next slide. Now, uh, as you heard <laughs> from our other speakers, uh, one of the most important findings in the last decade is that research use in policymaking occurs in a relationship-based culture. Here in the words of a Republican, this is a relationship business. The reality is if you want other people to pay attention to your research, the research that you believe is important, then it needs to start with having a relationship where you can have communication and trust. If someone won't talk to you or won't take you seriously, it's difficult to present them with research. So this finding has, has been like a paradigm shift. You know, so instead of thinking about disseminating research to policymakers, we need to think about building relationships with them. And I quote um, Itzik on this who said, we don't have a communication problem. We have a relationship problem. So if you want to engage policymakers, one of the first decisions you have to make, as it's said, is you have to decide whether you want to engage them yourself or whether you want to work through an intermediary, intermediary who already has these relationships um, developed. Now in state, legislatures, we learned that the first intermediary that legislators go to 
is the in-house legislative service agencies. So this is sort of like the Congressional Budget Office. You know, they're responsible for budget and fiscal analysis. They support committees. Uh, they do issue research and so on. And in the next slide, a Republican talked about these agencies. The reality is there are very, very few completely nonpartisan, nonpolitical data sources. Anyone who is doing the research has got a stake in the game. Otherwise, why are they doing it? I haven't found a lot of nonpartisan sources, unless it's one that's already being funded by the state, the Fiscal Bureau. And this is Wisconsin's nonpartisan legislative service agency. We consider that to be the gold standard for data. Now, in most states, but not all, not quite all, they're nonpartisan. Now, let's turn to another element of our theory, which is the institution. And this is on the next slide. What kind of information is preferred in a lawmaking institution? Can I have the next slide, please? There we go. When legislators are going to share information with each other, what kind of information do they prefer? A Republican told us, here's a quote, research had better be good. What you find has to be believable and significant. A Democrat told us that to be believable, I always go for the least biased information. And we heard consistently, in the words of another Democrat, it's getting increasingly more difficult to find the neutral source or the neutral research gatherer. Now, let me give you an example. I interviewed a Republican legislator who had received the most nominations from his colleagues in his state as being an exemplary research user. And he told me when Congress was debating the Affordable Care Act, he was asked to recommend a website, health was his area, that was the middle of the road. And he told me he had no clue which website to recommend. And the believability of research also has an added layer of complexity in a policymaking institution. Policy decisions are not made by a single policymaker. They're made through negotiation and compromise. So policymakers prefer sources that are seen as credible, that are seen as believable by their political adversaries. So surprisingly, conservatives told us uh, when they're trying to convince their colleagues, they steer away from conservative sources of information. And liberals told us when they're trying to convince their colleagues, they steer away from liberal sources of information. So your research is most apt to be valued by policymakers if you or the intermediary that you decide to work with has a nonpartisan reputation. And this reinforces the comparative advantage of science and that's its reputation for critical scrutiny and the contribution it can make to help policymakers reach consensus and compromise. Now, a third element of our theory is the inhabitants of policymaking. Policymakers operate in a world that is just overly crowded. In Wisconsin, there are 1,200 bills introduced in the Assembly each biennium and 600 in the Senate. It is not possible for a research, for a policymaker to read and study all these bills. So legislators specialize and they develop a reputation for being an expert on a particular subject. So they're called the go-to person in the legislature. In the literature, they're called the cue giver because these go-to legislators advise their colleagues on what position to take or how to vote. So key informants in our study told us these go-to legislators are more apt to use in-depth research to build trust from their colleagues. So if you want your research to permeate out through a lawmaking body, you get it into the hands of these go-to legislators. So what does this mean pragmatically? It means that you do not need a lot of relationships, but you do need relationships with the go-to policymaker in your area of expertise. And I have found these productive working relationships are not 
that hard to build. I mean, we're not talking here about meeting with a policymaker for a cup of coffee or having a drink with them after work. That's not what it is. This is about being responsive to questions that policymakers have, showing respect for the expertise and experience that they bring to the table, and being sincere. So in the last slide, um, we're, we're not destined to remain isolated on the island of research. The first step is I think we have to come to better know the way of life on the policy island, its culture, its institutions, and its inhabitants. And if you'd like to hear from policymakers themselves, here are some recent publications that um, tell the story in policymakers' um, own voice. Thanks, so, Rob, with that, I'll, I'll stop. Excellent. Um, we're going to have 10 minutes for Q&A, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tee up the questions. And so if Itzhak and Monica and Karen want to all come off mute, we can, we can come back up on the screen. And I'm going to ask each person, since we don't have a lot of time, to be as, as precise and concise in your, in your answers as you can be. So, Itzhak, first one's for you. Uh, Itzhak, uh, to what extent do you think the strategies you talked about, in particular knowledge brokering, sort of crosses sectors? In other words, something in education would work for health, would work for transportation, would work for all these different sectors that all influence health. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I mean, so j just to clarify, my project is actually health. I'm focusing on depression and mental health. We, it happened to be in schools, but it can be in, in other contexts. But in general, what, what we need to focus on is the process. So, you know, again, focusing on these kind of routines. So the decisions around these different topics, the same kind of dynamics happen each time, regardless if it's education policy, health policy, there's some nuance there. If, for example, some fields are more open to public scrutiny, uh, such as health and healthcare, where, where there's debates going on. Others, such, such as national defense, are not. And they're more kind of closed, and the brokers are a little bit different in that context. But the idea is that you need to understand the process and respect the process, just as you would in any kind of health promotion. When you think about behavior change, it is a process. When you think about organizational change, it is a process. So if you understand the policymaking process and you align your strategy with the policymaking process, you're likely to be successful regardless of what the context is. Great, thank you. Um, Monica, here's one for you. And actually, I could ask a couple of these, but I'll, I'll pick out one. So Monica, how do policymakers think about policy formulation in relation to existing policy, in particular, the idea of evaluation? And how, and how does evaluation of existing policy does or does not occur before they're considering a new policy? That's sort of in the policy process. Does that make sense? Yes, um, that's a very good uh, question. It is actually very process uh, laden in terms of developing new policies. So the, there is an internal process at the health department where we would work with uh, the program staff. So in the tobacco example, staff in our chronic disease bureau and the tobacco control staff. Uh, and our general counsel's office, and we would pull together any information that we had in terms of program evaluation research, the YRVS data that I mentioned, so both local and national uh, data. Uh, and then uh, there would be a vetting process. So we would, um, it, this is even before the public process of going to an open comment period. So we would work with our board of health, with the mayor's office, with the mayor's gen, uh, you know council, and uh, provide uh, you know standard briefing uh, documents or memos uh, weighing the pros and cons. So trying to be as objective about um, uh, the changes that we might be recommending, uh, and that all happens before a public comment period, uh, where the health department and every health department is different. Uh, would make the case, would present the data, we would present proposed changes, and then open up for uh, public comment. And usually there was a public hearing that would be held. So a lot of uh, work uh, to get to any changes or new, uh, new regulations. Excellent, that's great. That's a great example. Okay, Karen, here's one for you. Um, it was fascinating to learn that the most influential legislators are the people using research the most? 
And so we're thinking now in the recent past, let's say the last year or so, in some ways it seems like there's a tremendous political pressure against the use of science and policy making. Is this an anomaly or is it the new reality and how do we combat that? I added a little bit more to that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I like to say is that uh, policy making is fickle. You know, uh, elections happen and things change, political winds change, crises come up and things change. Um, and, and the one thing that I think is important to remember is not to stereotype policymakers. There really are a range. There are some policymakers we'll never see at a family impact seminar who could care less about research. But there are others who are really interested in research. And these happen to be the ones who are the go-to people that I talked about. And the whole system, the whole policymaking system operates on trust. So you can be influential if you have the trust of your constituents and the trust of your colleagues. So you need information that's going to stand up to the attacks that are going to come from the other side, because they're sure to come. There's going to be attacks. So if you put out what legislators would call it is garbage, you lose your potential to be the go-to person. You lose your potential to be the influential person. People are not going to listen to you again. If you give them bad information and, and, and it embarrasses them. I have many, many quotes about this. So it's important to keep in mind that the policy making ebbs and flows and that policy makers vary a lot. And we tend to hear more about the, <laughs> the policy makers who are less apt to use research, I think, in the media than the ones who are. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question. This could go to anyone, but I'm going to start again with you, Itzhak, and then see if, if Monica and Karen would add. So this is a question about health equity and structural racism. Um, as we think about improving health equity and addressing structural racism, do we have the evidence that we need to inform policy formulations? And how could implementation science be in, how implementation scientists be involved in that process? This is a very good question. So, so it, it, it is a great question. I'm going to actually uh, refer people to walk by uh, my colleague Vish at the Harvard University School of Public Health, talk about democratizing evidence. And this notion that we, even in even our service, if you think about a representative survey, if we take a representative sample of Americans of 1,000 people, very few of them will be African-Americans or minority, and we don't have the statistical power to represent them. Not only that, we're not reaching them with, with information or collecting information from them. One of the exciting things for me about knowledge brokering when I started to do this work was the fact that they listen to these communities and they can have a role now in communicating this evidence back into policymakers, but also to researchers and inform us about how we need to change the way we think about things. The other thing I wanna point out, which taps into something Karen said and it's relevant here as well, is this notion that evidence does not speak for itself. We keep talking about that. You need to be strategic about how you present evidence. Part of what policymakers try to do is to win an argument. They're trying to make a case for why we should or should not do something and the evidence has to be persuasive. So any evidence they perceive to be persuasive will be picked up. And another things we, we need to do is to connect that evidence to things they care about. So, you know, they may not care about depression right now, addressing depression, but they do care about opioid addiction. And if I told them that the one number one cause of opioid addiction within young people is depression, I made that link for them. And so that's conceptual use of evidence, understanding how it tap and fit and model can really help and the same too for, for issues of equity and, and, and diversity. Very good. Monica, what would you like to add about this issue of equity and policy and how to, how to enhance that and build that into a research portfolio? Yeah, this is a really great question because I think this is what we're trying to look at now at the foundation and with other partners, um, these uh, declarations that states and municipalities have made as, of racism as a public health crisis. So I think at last count on the EPHA website, there might've been over 150. And so the question that we have is, how are uh, communities moving beyond just the declaring mm -hmm. of public, as, of racism as a public health crisis? And because the actions to us speak louder than words, though the words are important to actually call it out. 
And so I do think uh, when I, just to add to what Itzhak said, um, you know, one thing that I know that our health departments have been focused on over the years is uh, the power of narrative and storytelling. Some of this happens with the health department. Some of this happens with the knowledge brokers or the intermediaries, your, your community partners. And so I, I definitely think at this uh, point in time uh, with racial reckoning, the pandemic, the economic meltdown, that there will be opportunities to think uh, differently about uh, racial justice and the, the work ahead. But but I think that would be the element that I'd add is the storytelling and the narrative element to buttress the research. Thank you. I know we're up on time. Karen, would you like to add anything to that, la that last question? That'll have to be our last question. Okay. Um, you know, we did hear a lot about stories <laughs> from yeah. our legislators and how powerful they are. And stories, if researchers, can tell stories. So they're used to hearing a lot of stories at hearings, right? And they're, they're hearing a story that's true for one person or one family. It's very true for them. But the stories um, that researchers can tell can reflect the experiences of a broad range of the population. So they can be particularly powerful. And building on what Itzik said, we we do find uh, that if you can link it to something that they care about, it's also helpful. And one thing we found overwhelmingly in our study that they care about is youth and families. Um, there was tremendous amount of support for youth and family issues. And of all the stories we heard, most of them were struggling, struggling youth and families. So I think um, looking at racial equity through a family lens may be a way to open legislators' minds, especially if it's on a topic they're thinking about, you know. Great. They're, they're Great dealing idea. with 1,200 issues in the assembly each year, so they can't afford to learn about something because it'd be nice to know. They got to be thinking about the issues they're dealing with. Great. That's a great idea. Okay, Karen, I know we're up on time. I'm going to let the audience know we did not get to every question, but I think you can feel free to email any of the panelists, myself or Karen, with various questions if you have something left, especially if it goes to a certain person. Um, Karen, what, what else would we like to say to wind up? Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. That was a fantastic range of uh, discussions around policy formulation. I think that this, we're trying to work through um, uh, the policy life cycle um, throughout our webinar series. Um, next time, we'll be talking about policy implementation. So we hope you'll join us. Um, and really, really appreciative to our uh, three speakers and to Ross, our moderator, for their great time today. Thank you all very much, and please stay well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.